Today we are into Acts chapter 9 and I'd invite you to grab your Bible if you haven't already and be ready to go in Acts chapter 9 because in we go. When we talk about Acts chapter 9 and the conversion of Paul, we, we probably should really be talking Saul. Um, here we find the father at work in the life of one individual in a pretty special way. So we start out as we as we introduce to Paul and we find somebody that is like he 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 likens himself almost to a beast that is consumed with hatred and anger his every breath was murderous he pursued christians he arrested them he imprisoned them he beat them on occasion and yes some of them were even killed he opposed anything that was to do with Jesus. And when the votes came up, I guess at the Sanhedrin or other councils, as to whether they should save or condemn Christians, Paul tells us that he voted to condemn Christians every single time. By his own confession, Paul or Saul was obsessed with the destruction of Christians and he was willing to do whatever and go wherever in order to stamp out this new fangled faith. And in one sick final twist, when he got the opportunity, he would try to force the Christians to blaspheme the name of Jesus, just to sink that knife in and twist it that little bit further. So was the depraved view of the world of Saul. It's interesting when we think about it because this was before John the Revelator had written his book of Revelation. And in Revelation, John wrote that he wished that the people of Laodicea were either hot or cold, but not lukewarm. Well, credit to Saul, he was not lukewarm. He was hot, but not in the Laodicean hot sense. He wasn't hot for God. He was freezing cold. He was hot on the trail of Christians. He was hot on the pathway of destroying anyone that took on the name of Christ. And so while I'll interchange between the name of Saul and Paul, and probably use Paul more often at this stage, he's known as Saul. When Jesus had been condemned to death, the Jewish leaders, of which Paul was an extended part at that point, even if a young man, the Jewish leaders did maintain some sense of what we call plausible deniability. Plausible deniability just means that while they had really been responsible for the death of Jesus, they hadn't been the ones that had passed the sentence, nor were they the ones that carried out the execution. The Romans did that on their behalf. So they had a degree of plausible deniability um, with Jesus' death. But soon there was to, to come an even dirtier, messier death. And that was none other than the, than the death of Stephen. Stephen was one of the, the early deacons, became a great, um, well, a great preacher, really. And as he came and was dragged before the Sanhedrin, false charges were brought against him. And, and the way the, the book of Acts records it was he stands there with his face looking like an angel. And as he speaks to them, he delivers this message from Scripture that just opens up the hypocrisy and the anger that was, was there in the religious leaders, the petty jealousies. Um, so the Sanhedrin end up condemning Stephen. And, and they just go, it's, it's not even that they go through a formal process of condemnation. They just erupt in fury and anger. And they drag him out of the city as if somehow by going outside of the city, things are going to, you know, be better. Because of course, if you kill somebody outside the city, it's better than if you kill them in the city, whatever that's about. But outside the city, they, they pick up stones and in this horrific act, 
This time there is no plausible deniability. Every one of them bear the responsibility for this. And so in this moment, they pick up stones and start to rain those stones down onto him. Now, they believed that by stoning them, by stoning somebody, it actually removed some of the responsibility because no one would be certain which stone it was that struck the death blow. But of course, die he did at the hand of all of them. And in those final moments, you have Stephen, who is full of the Holy Spirit. He looks up into heaven and he sees Jesus and he utters these immortal words that, that reflect the prayer that Jesus prayed as he died. And he prays, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And as he's forced down to his knees under the weight of the stones that hit him, he finally utters again the final words that reflect the words of Jesus. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And he dies. Stephen, the great man, is dead. He is no more. He is gone. Acts records that Saul had been there that day and the words and the sight of Stephen, I suspect, now goaded Paul into further action. Because it would have only been when he was busy, when his mind was occupied, that he could temporarily expunge the memory of what he had seen and heard, the innocence of Stephen as he died a martyr's death. Another death that Saul was present giving his approval for, says Scripture. And so now Saul looks to go further afield. He looks to do more for the cause which he is fighting. He is on the path of persecuting Christians. And so what's happened is the persecution has happened in Jerusalem but now, as the persecution has driven the Christians out of Jerusalem, they've spread. And so he realizes that you have to stop the spread of this infuriating teaching or what he viewed as infuriating teaching. So he goes to the high priest, he goes to the council, he goes to the high priest and he gets letters from them. And these letters gave him authority even in the eyes of the Romans, to go and within the Jewish community carry out Jewish law. And as he carries out those, those actions, he goes with the full weight and authority of the religious leaders of Israel. He's now on his way to Damascus with the same authority that he had in Jerusalem. He can arrest, he can imprison, and in this case, the intention is to arrest and return people to Jerusalem to face their version of justice. And Damascus had a, a sizable Jewish community, um, a number of synagogues, and Paul was going to protect them. And so the trip to Damascus was some 250 kilometres, Jerusalem, to Damascus would have easily been a week's walk, a week's travel. And so as they travel, it was pretty arid country. It was not the sort of country that they would have stopped in any significant sense. And so finally, on the last day of the journey, it's somewhere about midday, the sun reaches its zenith. And there, everything changes. See, things had been building in Paul's life. The road to Damascus had led through Galilee. And so just imagine what that trip would have been like for Paul as he walks through some of those areas where remarkable things had happened at the word and touch of Jesus. Imagine what Saul would have felt as he traveled, because as you travel, yes, he had companions, but as you travel you think. And so Saul has lots of time to think, to wrestle, to grapple with all the things he had seen and done and heard walking through that region. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 3, 
It records it this way as he comes in and he's hanging on to his pride, his self-righteousness, his anger. He says, as he was approaching Damascus in, the, in, in his mission, on his mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The men with Paul stood speechless for they heard the sound of someone's voice but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand into Damascus and he remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Paul's conversion story is the defining event in his life. It's so important to him that, well, in Acts alone, we get three accounts of it. And every time the story is told, we get additional detail. Here in chapter 9, chapter 22, and then in chapter 26. And we get it four times in his letters, not to mention the multiple references. It's there in Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, Timothy. Each time he's recounting different details and sometimes repeating elements of the story because it defines who he is. And so here you have Saul en route to Damascus to arrest and imprison people whose names he does not know. And he is confronted by the one who knows his name, And now Saul becomes the prisoner. In the sense, Saul, who is going to arrest others, is now arrested by Jesus Christ himself. And here he is, the one who had been in charge, aggressive, certain, adamant as to what he will do. And he is now blind and helpless and being led meekly, by the hand, like a child, into Damascus. We learn more of his Damascus encounter as we go through Acts. You know, in in Acts chapter 9, it says there was a sudden light from heaven. Acts chapter 22 adds that it was a bright light. Acts chapter 26 says the light was as bright as the sun. His companions do not see Jesus as Paul does but they do see the light. They hear the sound, but they don't understand, Acts chapter 22 says. And Acts chapter 26 adds that Paul hears the message from Jesus in Aramaic. Now note also that while Saul has been on this murderous rampage, it just says that Jesus knows. This is his church. This is his people. This is Jesus that Saul, that Paul is persecuting. And it just reassures us that if we are feeling persecuted or if we are in troubled times, Jesus knows, he sees us and he will act. He knows. And so here Jesus finally confronts Saul He confronts him to provide clarity about who it is that he's persecuting. In in his recounting of it in Acts chapter 26, Paul recalls just an additional sentence there after the, the confronting by Jesus. And Jesus says to him, it is hard for you, Paul, to kick against the goads not something we we automatically understand, but a goad was just a stick, possibly with a metal end or some attachment to the end that people would use to prod and to poke lazy cattle, Um, particularly, I guess, if they were pulling a, a, a wagon or something like that. The goad would goad them on. It wouldn't be comfortable, but it would keep them moving. And so now there's this sense that Paul is being goaded by Jesus, being prodded and poked and his conscience being pricked. 
Why? Well, I think I like the way that, that Charles Spurgeon sums this up. In 1916, Charles Spurgeon says this, Some men, it is true, are brought to God by gentle means. They are drawn by soft but mighty bonds. Still, a much larger class of persons remains upon whom these silken cords would exert no influence. They must not be handled softly, but must be dealt with heavily. It's a great quote because it gives that sense of how Jesus has to, I guess, deal with Paul a little more heavily just to get his attention. Because he has to have this, this conversation with, with Saul so that Saul can know who it is he's persecuting. Now, Paul is not forced to, con to, to convert. He is not forced to accept Jesus. He does not overcome Paul and turn him into a robot. Jesus gives Saul the opportunity to become the man that God intended him to be. And so you have this sense where Paul, who has been imprisoned by sin, is now arrested by Jesus. And being arrested by Jesus, he is set free by the liberating grace of God. In Acts chapter 22, Saul asks a question. After having Jesus revealed to him, he says to Jesus, so what shall I do? And Jesus doesn't answer that question precisely. In fact, Jesus just gives him one instruction. He says, go to Damascus and wait there for instructions. You'll be told what to do. And it's almost like, you know, this international spy thriller, only better. Jesus gives him time to reflect and wait on God and come to terms with what has happened. And he goes there to Damascus for three days. He waits and his instructions are going to come to him, but they will come via the church. And let's have a read of that now in Acts chapter 9 and verse 10. It says, now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. Think about poor Ananias here for a moment. The Lord comes and speaks to him, as it says there in a vision, and calls, Ananias, yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He's praying to me right now. I've shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he's authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Just think about Ananias here for a moment with what he is confronted with. You know, this is an extraordinary conversation with the Lord. This is Ananias's potential Jonah moment. Lord, must I go to this murderous, feared enemy? This scheming, angry, obsessed man? And not only must I go to him, but I have to lay hands on him and let him see again and commission him. You have to be kidding, Lord. No suicide missions for me. And so we then turn to verse 17 and 18. Because again, in Acts chapter 9, it says, So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul. Notice those words. Brother Saul. Ananias treats Saul as a friend in Christ. Brother Saul. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit 
and instantly something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight and then he got up and was baptised. Ananias is chosen by God for a special task at this point. He's probably Paul's first Christian contact post his conversion. The first Christian man that he meets. And Ananias, who could have run away, instead decides that he will be obedient to what God has asked him to do. And so he walks into this encounter believing that Saul is probably still this evil man and he leaves with a changed mind, having commissioned Paul to follow Christ. Saul approaches Damascus as a sworn enemy of the way and leaves a follower of the way. Both Ananias and Paul are on the receiving end of the transforming grace of Jesus. And as Ananias lays hands on Paul to commission him to to take the message to the Gentiles, to take the message to the kings, to take the message to the people of Israel, there is no line of apostolic Um, succession here. Ananias, we don't know a whole lot about him other than that he is a devout and obedient follower of Jesus. But there is nothing special about Ananias beside that. This is no, you know, thing retained for some special class of people. This is God using his man to send another man on his mission. And in Paul, we end up seeing extraordinary change. He's had three days of soul agony. Three days of praying and reflecting on what has been three days of blindness and the Holy Spirit works in him. The Holy Spirit changes him and and somehow in this process, Saul comes to realise what he is called to. And so he gets up, he's baptised, his sins are washed away, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's chosen of God. And in the new Saul, in the, in the one who we know better as Paul, he becomes this person that reflects astounding and wonderful change. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 22, it says that Saul's preaching became more and more powerful. And the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. And so after a while, some of the Jews plotted together to kill him. And it's, it's a classic ploy. You know, here he is um, preaching amazingly powerful stuff. He is unanswerable for the Jews, so powerful is his preaching. And I guess as happens sometimes, if you can't beat what's been presented, if you can't defeat the argument, then you play the man. And so play the man they do. Now, in those short few verses, Luke actually sums up two or three years. And whether um, Paul goes to Arabia and back to Damascus and then down to Jerusalem or stays in Damascus for that time and then goes to Jerusalem and there's Arabia somewhere in there, we're not going to worry about that today. But the point is, he ends up having to escape from Damascus. He's let over a wall in a basket and ends up ultimately in Jerusalem. And when he ends up in Jerusalem, the Christians are reluctant to receive him. And you can understand that because, you know, is he one that is scheming to get into the Christian network so he can destroy it? And so as he turns up there in Jerusalem, they at first keep him at arm's length until Barnabas comes into the story. And Barnabas is that man who sees the best in Paul. Where most saw the worst and were worried, Barnabas saw and accepted and saw the best. And it makes me think, you know, if you and I had been there, what would we have seen in Paul? Would we have been suspicious and have seen the worst and held him away? Or would we have been like Barnabas and checked it out and seen the best? best in what he could be. So here we have Paul now in Jerusalem. He's not there for long because, well, 
Paul's a bit of a lightning rod, actually, for, for attention. And so he leaves Jerusalem originally to go to Damascus seeking fugitives. Now he leaves Jerusalem as a fugitive. The, the, the leaders of the church send him away. And so we come to Acts chapter 9, verse 31. And there it says, the church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria. And it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord and with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. It also grew in numbers. And you see those five words highlighted there. The church has peace. The persecutor is no more. He's now a converted persecutor. The lightning rod for attention is gone. So the church has peace, even though there's still persecution. The church becomes stronger partly through the witness of Paul. As the believers live in the fear of the Lord, we'd call that godliness. And they have great encouragement through the Holy Spirit and it grows in numbers. What an amazing time that must have been. So Paul now is a converted man and everyone can see it, whether you're for him or against him. He has ceased to do what he wants and begun to do what Christ wants. It's what it means to become a Christian. It is indeed the conversion experience. It's when we stop doing what we want and start doing what Jesus wants. And Paul's letters reveal that new man. You know, he is humble. He is called by grace. He is the one centered on Christ. He sees himself as the least of the apostles because of what he has done. Saul's conversion is, however, his own. Peter's conversion experience is different and some of the others in there would have been different and yours may be different as well. We don't have to have a road to Damascus experience, even though we may. It's just that, well, Paul was a hard nut to crack. And so what we see now in this chapter is Paul is preparing and growing Paul and Peter in and for ministry. Chapter 9 ends with two miracles from Peter. He raises a man who has been paralyzed for eight years. He raises him to his feet. Then he comes to Dorcas. Dorcas has died and he raises her back to life. And and Peter is about to have in the next chapter a visionary encounter with God. But we'll leave that story for next week because God is seeking to grow. He's grown Paul to the place where Paul now realizes his mission is to the Gentiles. And so now what he wants to do is to grow Peter to the place where he knows the mission is to the Gentiles as well, because Peter has to be within the Jewish Christian community, community has to be the bridge for Paul the Gentile bridge before Paul can do what God has commissioned him to do. And so what we see here is the father working through Paul. The father, the sovereign God, directs the events of Acts 9. The son reveals himself as he confronts Paul and the Holy Spirit fills Paul and enables a lifetime of powerful ministry. And it was a ministry before, you know, beyond and Paul, Peter's, it was beyond anyone's wildest imaginings. And some suggest that Paul's conversion was actually his completion. And whatever words we use, Paul was completed and converted at this point. And so I guess we bring it back to what does this mean for us? You know, what about you and me? Are you complete? Am I complete? Are we all that God wants us to be? Have I surrendered my life to Jesus? Am I truly converted in that I seek no longer to do my will, but the will of Jesus? The truth is that Jesus called Paul, Peter, Matthew, James, and we could go on and on all the disciples named and unnamed. And that same Jesus today calls you and I. And the simple question is this. When Jesus calls you, whether he has to confront you on the road to Damascus or he calls you with that still small voice, how will you respond to Jesus' call? How will you respond? Let's pray. 
Father, as we close off our time together now in prayer, we want to thank you for the life of Paul, for the, the conversion experience that shows us the working of the Father, the Father that loves each one of us, the Father that will do what it takes for us to understand what is before us. And whether we are hard nut to crack like Paul or whether we're more receptive and just hear the still quiet voice, Lord, today you call us, you call every one of us. And I pray that every one of us would respond, that we would be completed in Jesus, that we would put aside our will and we would begin or continue to do the will of Jesus. And I pray that would be the decision of each one watching and here today. In Jesus' name, amen.